I don't know that many members of the church really understand the teaching of the Bible, the authority of Christ regarding our responsibility to confess our sins. We first of all, I suppose, must emphasize again that sin is not violating somebody who doesn't like what you do, or the clothes you wear, where you didn't go, or whatever. Sin is the transgression of God's law, period. It's the only thing that can keep anybody out of heaven. You may not wear matching ties. That won't keep you out of heaven. You may not buy the car your parents bought, and they may think it's terrible that you now don't do that. And you may offend some people. That won't keep you out of heaven unless it leads you to violate God's law. What we need to know is that sin is violating God's law. Whether we leave undone what God says we must do, it's imperative to be saved, or whether it is that we just do what we should not do, and God's told us what we shouldn't do. When a person does that out in the world, and that's how we put it, to mean contrary to being in the church, a Christian, then they sin, and all is sin, and come short of the glory of God. They've all, everybody has violated God's law and thus separated themselves from God. Romans 3.23. Romans 6.23. Those two passages make it clear we need the mercy of God. We need the favor of God. We need to know how God's love and His mercy reconciles the sinner to the one who's offended the one we've been separated from by the sins that we committed. And all sin, though it may involve other things and people in transgressing God's law, is ultimately and finally against God. Thus we have the plan of salvation for the one out in the world that needs to become a Christian. A member of the church that Jesus built, that he purchased with his own precious blood, of which he is head, and to which he adds everybody that he saves. And all those he saves are those who believed and obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God to save us. In other words, God's located his saving power in the New Testament system of salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 uh, tells you the very fundamentals of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Without that, nothing in the Bible matters. Christ was tempted in every point, like as we are yet without sin. Thus, He is the one that could go to the cross and die on our behalf and all people. And it's through His death that we find remission of sins and reconciliation to God in the church of Christ. So when you read about the church starting in Acts 2, people heard and believed the gospel and they were in completion to their obedience to the plan of salvation baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. And uh, verse 42 and 47 says, The Lord added them to the church. And they began to assemble fellowship and work with all those who had believed and from the heart obeyed that same form of doctrine, Romans 6, 3 and 4, and verses 17 and 18. Now once in the church... Does that mean there's no more room for growth and development? No more possibility that one can sin as a child of God? No. But the gospel system takes care of that too. It's as much, listen to me, it's as much a part of being faithful to the Lord to confess your sins as a child of God, having first repented of them, as it is to have observed the Lord's Supper correctly or worship God correctly. That's provision made for the member of the church, the Christian, when... He or she sins. It is the repentance and confession of that sin. Confession always representing the fact that you're willing to say, I have sinned. Have you ever noticed? I, I have, certainly as a preacher of the gospel for all these years. There's where the problem is. You say, from the truth of the Bible, you have sinned. And the person sitting there says, no, I haven't. If the people were willing in the light of the rightly divided New Testament of Christ or the whole Bible, when it confronts them to say, I've transgressed God's law, there wouldn't be a problem from becoming a Christian to living a faithful Christian life. They would not be solved immediately because that person would have said, 
I have sinned. Now how do I take care of it? Now you see that, and it's not by accident, in the first recorded gospel sermon in Acts 2, the one that Peter preached. As the truth is laid out that they did not know, though they were very religious people, very devout people, as the truth is laid out to them concerning Jesus Christ, they don't even let the sermon end. They cry out, and why? Because they were pricked in their heart by the truth, and it convicted them that they had sinned. They violated God's will, and as devout religious Jews, they stood condemned before God. And so they cry out unto Peter, to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You know what that is? You're right. The evidence is in. We're honest, and we have sinned. Tell us what to do to remedy the matter. When people are in an audience, whether they're members of the church, and sin is members of the church, or they need to obey the gospel to become a Christian, when you present the truth of God's word... Them believing it is God's word and they are accountable to God on the basis of that word. And you point out to them what they've done that makes them stand or in this case sit condemned before God. If they have the disposition of heart that's characteristic of those people who cried out men and brethren what shall we do because the truth had pricked them in their heart. Verse 37 of Acts 2. There would be no hesitancy. But we find ourselves pleading and begging with people who say God exists, Christ is the Son of God, the Bible is His Word, it will judge us on the last day, we must live by it. And when you lay those things out before people, they sit there saying, not me, why did you ever be baptized in the first place? Because when you were baptized scripturally, having believed in Christ, repented of your sins, confessed your faith in Christ, completed your obedience to the gospel by being baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, to obtain those remission of sins, God in his mind saying you're no longer guilty, I forgive you. Then you said in the process of repentance that you were going to live the rest of your life doing your best to know the Bible and live like it said. In any place you saw that you were out of harmony with it, you'd correct it. So it's what I said a minute ago. If you're outside of Christ, you'll teach the truth that shows that person outside of Christ is lost. And the person either says, that's right, I am lost. I need to do something about it. Or a person in the church seeing that they're not living like the New Testament says Christians ought to live and they hear the word of God or they read it or somebody points it out to them. They say, that's right, that was a sin against God. And they repent of it. And they confess that sin. So you see, in one way or the other, we spend all of our days in sermons as we instruct in the Bible, whatever it may be, trying to get people who need to to say, that's right, I've sinned and I'm turning away from it. And if we had the disposition of heart that was in those people who gladly received his word, Acts 2.41, those devout Jews gathered out of every nation under heaven, if we had the honesty of heart, Luke 8.15, that they did, there wouldn't be any, wait a minute, I'll put this, I'm not, I don't think I am. I think, let me go check with another preacher. Well, I don't know what the other preacher may say, but if he teaches you the truth as it is in Christ, he'll tell you the exact same thing that the truth that is in Christ tells me. So I said about Charlie a while ago, and one reason I did that is because he confessed a specific sin and it took place in a specific place. Listen to what John had to say to Christians. This is not those outside of Christ needing to become Christians. 1 John chapter 1, after that beautiful statement in verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now watch. Verse 9. If, conditional you see, conditional, if you meet the conditions, this is going to happen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I know many members of the church always are amazed at the people outside the church and the denomination of the world that they just can't see. Why it is that folks can't understand that a person must be baptized in order to obtain remission of sin. Well, let me 
join with you and add one to it. I just can't see. What is so hard about if we confess our sins as Christians, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. The forgiveness is contingent upon what? In your mind, you say, what God said in His Word about sin, I'm guilty of, and I confess it, whether it's a specific sin or whether it's several sins. But that's not all the divine volume had to say about children of God keeping in the light, walk, being cleansed by the blood and walking in the light. Because you see, you're not walking in the light if you don't read the rest of those verses following verse 7 and believe them and apply them too, which has to do with confessing sins. Confessing sins as a child of God is a part of walking in the light. Of truth is what that means. But listen to James, again writing to Christians. Verse 16 of chapter 5, confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, let's see. Very difficult English. Confess your faults one to another. Is that beyond us in our understanding of the English language as it translates actually what the Greeks said, which the Holy Spirit put in this book? Chimes right in, doesn't it, with what John said? Since God wrote the Bible, we know there's no contradictions. They're saying the same thing. This is obligatory upon us in order to be faithful. Confess your faults, trespasses, sins, one to another. You know, when you do that, you keep yourself humble. If you've ever confessed a fault, a trespass, whatever it might be. The result of that, I promise you, if you're honest in it, is that you feel more humble after it's over with. When you clear the air in your own conscience, and it's all behind you, because God has promised when you comply with His will for the forgiveness of sins, your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more. And that means I won't bring them up to you anymore. You've taken care of them by complying with God's will. So I take occasion of what Charlie did, not because it's peculiar to Charlie, but because that's what every one of us as members of the church must do as we walk in the light as he is in the light, having fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ continually cleansing us from our sins, 1 John 1, 7. But I'm sad to say, though I don't have to know what God can know in the people's minds. So many times when the truth is preached and it pricks the hearts of people, a resistance starts. Why, who I am, if I confess that I sin, what will they think of me? I've never known a case, and it's I, I, all I can say. I've never known a case in these nearly whew, 50 years of preaching coming on for too long to where brethren who have sinned and comply with the Lord's will for brethren to gain remission of sins have ever had people say, Boy, I'm glad to know he's sinned. Let's hold that up against him for the rest of his life. I've never seen that. Maybe you have. I haven't. I've seen people rejoice. I've seen them come and embrace folks, though they knew nothing about the sin, they were happy that a person had that kind of humble, meek attitude that they would receive with meekness the engrafted word and comply with what it said and be freed of those sins. You know, nobody can ultimately know your mind like you do besides God. So when a person has that kind of conscience that it's so tender, and oh, we ought to be praying for tender consciences, that's so tender that when you get the idea that I may have brought reproach on the church by my actions, it might do well for us to ask, when I engage in an activity, is that all right for the elders to engage in it? And how long would it be put up with if the preacher did it? I'm telling you right now, whether you like to hear it or not, for the preacher, most people have a higher, tighter, more restrictive standard than they do for their brethren. 
Now, they won't admit that, thus they sin and ought to confess too, but that's what they do. Members of the church can bring reproach on the Lord's church all day long. And if the preacher did one of those things, he's going to be packing his bags and going somewhere else. Oh, but that's, that's just not that way. You don't know what you're talking about. You just are speaking out of your ignorance to think that that kind of thing doesn't happen. That again shows us the need for Christians to walk, Paul said, by the same rule. That we must therefore be receiving with meekness whoever we are. Elders, deacons, Bible school teachers, parents. The willingness, let's see, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. That's a part of being faithful. Is the honest, objective evaluation of yourself. Would you want somebody to conduct himself or herself as I have conducted myself. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Now I want to show you what Paul was willing to say about his life to that young preacher Timothy. Of him he said, I have no man like-minded. I thought that's probably one of the greatest compliments a young preacher or anybody could ever receive is for Paul to say, he's the only man I know that sees things and operates and views things like I do. Now, to say that, that is a, that's a compliment. That's a compliment. Consider what Paul says this young man. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says in verse 12, Let no man despise thy youth. Now watch. How do you do that, Paul? But be thou an example. Did you get that? You be a pattern. You be an example of the believers. How do you do that? In word, in conversation, that's your conduct. In love, charity, in spirit, disposition of mind, outlook on life. In faith, your confidence in God based only on the Word of God, doing only what's authorized by the Word of God. In purity, you're pure because you live as the Bible says and you're willing to correct anything when you know it's out of harmony with God. Remember, David, God said, I found David a man after my own heart. Well, he committed some sins about as bad anybody could ever commit. Was he still a man after God's own heart? He was. Because when Nathan told his little story that convicted David of the sin, and he hadn't really even realized that he was convicting himself of sin, the bold preacher said, Thou art the man. And the whole thing came down on him. And what did he do? I'm king. Makes any difference? I'm king. It may apply to everyone on the rest of you, but I'm king. He was an absolute monarch, you know, and his word was law, but he didn't. He humbled himself, and he admitted that was the case. Saul never did, that is King Saul. He was still a man after God's own heart, not when he committed the sins, but his disposition of heart when the finger pointed at him, and it needed to point at him, and convicted him of sin. He didn't try to reject it. He didn't try to justify himself. And who's going to try to, if he says, no, that's not the way it's going to be, who's going to try to do anything about it? He's the king. And then he tells him, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, and so on. But be thou an example. Folks, that's me and that's you. Be thou a pattern that when people see you act, that's the way Christians do in every circumstance and situation. And when you don't, you confess your sins. Well, do we have anything else in the Bible along that line? Right back in the early days of the church in Acts chapter 8, 
We come to Samaria. Philip's gone to Samaria. Done great work in preaching the gospel. A lot of folks are obedient to the gospel. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now they had a fellow up there who was a really a great deceiver, if you can call it that. And you got to understand the mindset of those days and what religion was and the superstitions that they had. This man, Simon, was a sorcerer, which means he pretended he had powers he didn't. And he hears the truth and believes it and becomes a Christian too. But then, seeing they had no written down New Testament, the apostles, Peter and John, are sent down there to Samaria because they need to confer these miraculous gifts on members of the church so they'll have the wherewithal to live the Christian life. Well, it doesn't take very long for Simon to see what was happening. Verse 18, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. He didn't want to work a miracle. He wanted the power to bestow the power to work miracles on others. Now, he's a new Christian. He's a babe in Christ. He comes out of a terribly pagan background, having lived a life of deceiving people. For he knew very well he didn't have any extra powers. But he's, what he amounts to, he's a great magician. But when he desires this, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Peter didn't pull a punch. Listen. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee. Boy, now wait, Peter. We've got to call you. You can't talk to a young member of the church like this. He's tender. He doesn't know any better. And you know, Peter's only an apostle. He's only speaking as God through him speaks. So you, you have to correct Peter, don't you? Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Now, well, all right, what's he to do as a child of God? Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Now watch. Peter says, I can tell by your fruits what you are. Notice how he says it. For I perceive, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon, which demonstrates what he really was like as far as his disposition toward the truth that convicted him and the harsh rebuke of the apostle. Pray ye the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Now, what I found out, a great many of my brethren over the years, when you come down like a load of bricks on somebody, though he gets as guilty as he can be, I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> well, all right, go. But your sin goes with you, and hell lies ahead of you. <laughs> That's all there is to it. You die, any sin in your life unforgiven, forget it. You're gone. The Lord's given us the great blessing of a gospel system that as we live by it, the blood continues to cleanse us, and we go into eternity as if we had never sinned. And one of the chief parts of that gospel system that we walk in is that you confess your sins when you know you're guilty of them. And if you don't, the blood of Christ is not going to continue to cleanse you. Well, is that all the Bible has to say about things like that? No. Charlie mentioned a specific act in his life at work regarding his boss, and he's made that right. He could have very well said, that is, Charlie, well, that's between me and the boss at work. I'll go, between, I'll go to him and make it right, and that's fine. That's up to him. I think Charlie is saying, I will make it as sure as I can. And you know, when it comes to going to heaven and hell, that's not a bad attitude to take. I'm, have you ever said this? I'm going to cover all bases. Well, we think that wise in other things. But we sort of ignore it when it comes to living the Christian life. Seems to me if anybody wants to cover all bases, it ought to be the child of God who wants to be faithful to him. Jesus taught about these matters, and he drew a line in the difference between a private sin where I may, I'll use Buddy for example, sin against him, transgress God's law in dealing with him, and, and only Buddy and me know about it, that is, besides God. Listen to this. Moreover, chapter 15, Matthew 18, Moreover, if thy brother trespass against thee, 
Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now, if both of us have a disposition of heart, and I've sinned against him, broken God's law and dealing with him, God knows it, Buddy and I know it. They're the only ones that do know it. <laughs> or we are in our illustration. And Buddy comes to me, as maybe Peter did with Simon, and he points this out to me. Now, if I say, you know, buddy, that's right. That's what I ought to say. That's a scriptural thing to do. That's a godly thing to do. Oh, yeah, that's a Christian thing to do. That's right. Didn't really realize that's what was happening. Maybe I could say that. But I see that now. Clear in my mind that I have sinned against you in dealing with this matter. Now, it ends there. And nobody else ever knows about it. It's all been reconciled. All been taken care of. Well, what if I don't admit it? Verse 16, But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now you see, that's very difficult in English to understand. <laughs> no, it's not. I was sarcastic saying that to make a point. And by the way, going back to Simon the sorcerer, well, I'm sure it was hard Peter. Listen, he never forgot that. You can be sure Simon never forgot forgot what it was to violate God's will and consequences and how quickly it ought to be dealt with how swiftly and how bluntly we in the church or we got forever now we'll say to a person needing to be baptized you better obey the gospel now but to a member of the church well you got forever and usually forever means it'll never get done and they'll go before the judgment lost Okay, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses everywhere be established that's the next step Starting with two people, known only to them and God. But if the one that's guilty doesn't admit sins when the one that's faithful comes to him, then it goes to the second step. Take two with you, two or more, so that everything can be established. Well, let's suppose that happens. In this case, in our illustration, if I repent, fine, it all stops there. But now we got verse 17 taking care of the rest of it. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now let's look at this for a minute. Look at the steps. This is the third step. Two or three witnesses couldn't get the man to repent. In this case, me. My illustration about Buddy being the one I sinned against. Well, then what are those witnesses to do? They put it before the church. And here's where it usually goes kapui and stops. Because every member of that congregation is not going to go to this person and say, You've sinned. All sorts of foot dragging starts. Now, you think God's happy with that? If you do, I'd like you to show me in the Bible where He is. Then, if He just will not hear every member of the church who, on the basis of witnesses, goes and says, You're guilty in the way you treated, buddy, then what? If he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Now, what does that mean? That's said to their culture, to their situation, what a heathen was and what a publican was. A publican was a Jew who took up Roman taxes and, and took up a lot of extra for himself. And the Jews had not one thing in the world to do with that kind of person. Heathen is a non-Jew, an uncircumcised Gentile. They had not one thing to do with that person either. Well, how do I know? How do I know how the Jews treated those who were not Jews? Gentile. Well, have you ever looked in Acts 10 and 11, the case of Cornelius and his conversion? Have you ever noticed what Peter says concerning the vision that God's trying to show him that under the gospel system, everybody, including uncircumcised Gentiles, has a right to the gospel? Well, you know in Acts uh, chapter 10, where you have the account, verse um, 11, he's in a trance, Peter is, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at four corners, let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. There came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now watch what Peter does, and he does it three times. Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Common or unclean according to what? The law of Moses. They still don't know at this point. Even apostles 
what all the gospel has for everybody and they're learning as situations arise and God reveals it to them. And in this case, he's revealing to them the uncircumcised Gentile has a right to the gospel just like you. Well, look as you go into 11 where Peter's been called to account and he's rehearsing what happened. And notice what he's got <laughs> in trouble he's got because when he relates all of this to Jerusalem, Notice the accusation, verse 2 of chapter 11. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, expounded it by order unto them. And he tells what happened. In verse uh, 8 is where he says the same thing as he gets to that point about the vision. And then notice when he gets over to the situation with Cornelius. He makes it very clear that a Jew doesn't go into anybody that's a non-Jew and have anything to do with them at all. Jesus said concerning the member of the church it sins and refuses to repent. As far as the faithful members are concerned, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now I want to know how much association was Peter having when he still believed he should follow the restrictions of the law and which tells us all righteous Jews acted the same way. How much association did they have with an uncircumcised Gentile? Does that word none keep wanting to come up there in your mind? Big goose egg? All right. Jesus said, if you know that as the church, you can get it. It's not that we don't get it, brethren. We get it. And here's where the problem is among all of us. And an old stubborn, rebellious heart is a seed of all sin against God. We won't do it the Lord's way. Yet we said at the point of repentance and obeying the gospel that the rest of our life would be doing it the Lord's way. Well, now, we've got to understand this. We sit down and talk about it a minute. And then talk about it. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. Period. You are or you aren't. If you don't, you won't acknowledge it as sin. Make it as sure as you can. Your soul may be required of you before this day is over. So I have changed it because, as Paul might say, uh, on, because I take occasion by Charlie's good confession and much appreciated to say, go and do thou likewise if need be and don't try to work it out to where, well, I don't know. Yeah, you do. You know. You just don't want people to know that you have sinned. It's pride. Vain, glory, lie. Me? Sin? Well, folks, I'd be sinning if I didn't preach this. <laughs> Something about us, we, the idea of humility, the idea of humbleness is essential to going to heaven. Not me. Well, I'm a preacher. Everybody knows there's no preacher that sins. I, I'm an elder in the church. I can't afford to admit I've sinned. How could people look up to me? I teach Bible class for 39 years and a half. I'm a teacher of truth. They can't believe I sin. Especially coming down to confessing a specific sin. Me lie? Tell a falsehood with the intent to deceive? Not me. Yeah, well, I did, but I can't tell them that. <laughs> and that's the way the devil works. That's practical. That comes right down to where we are, folks. And whatever it may be. And remember, it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Thing, glory of life. Those are the three avenues whereby God, or rather the devil, leads us to transgress God's will. And many times we focus on lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. And we, you know, we go on that way. But one is just as much an avenue to get you to transgress God's law and stand before Him condemned and headed for torment eternally as any of the other. And I would say a whole host of folks who aren't bothered at all by the lust of the flesh and, and the lust of the eyes may have a big problem when it comes down to the pride of life. The vainglory of life. 
to be seen of men. You know what Jesus said to the Pharisees when they did all that they did and said, I, I, don't you, look at me, I'm the greatest that ever was in service to God. What would God do without me? You remember what he said about them? They have their reward because that's what they wanted, to be seen of men. But when they were selecting a king to take Saul's place, God made it very clear to Samuel. Don't look on his outward countenance and what he appears to be like. Look at his heart. That is what is born out in his life that comes from the in-depth part of him. I have an obligation for your good, and so does every one of us, and for all of our good spiritually to conduct myself wherever I am in harmony with the scriptures that I might be able to say whatever I did or did not do or even the way I did it, everybody else ought to go and do the same thing. Now you think about that and then think about confessing your sins one to another. Of course, unless they repented, it does no good. The idea in the Bible is if you've repented, you will confess them. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we've studied what to do to become a Christian. And we've spent all our time on why the Bible teaches that Christians will confess their sins one to another. If you're subject then to the Lord's good and loving invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.